and a lightning bolt hit me right in the chest. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Keith, you know, that's not what I said. Jesus never said this represents anything. He said, this is my body. And I looked around and I saw my wife with our three little kids and our youngest in a stroller and she was wheeling him around. And I saw these 150 teenagers in there worshiping Jesus. And this little voice inside my head said, Keith, are you really gonna blow all this up to become Catholic? Mess up your entire family and leave all these kids behind who are looking to you? Are you really gonna do that? Come on, Keith. I'm sad to say, that's the voice I listened to. My dad is a pastor, so I was raised going to church my whole life. I always knew about Jesus. But when I was 11 years old, I had my first conversion experience where at a church camp, the pastor asked the question, if you died tonight, where would you go, heaven or hell? And of course, we all wanted to know that the answer would be heaven. So he said, come down front and pray this prayer with me, and then you can know for sure. So that's what I did. At 11 years old, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I guess from that point in time, I felt like I'm good to go. So I lived the life of a normal teenager, tried to do the best I could to stay out of trouble. But really, Jesus wasn't my focus. He wasn't the most important person or thing in my life. I was. And that all changed for me when I was 19 years old. I'd moved out to Philadelphia to play drums in a rock band. And while I was there, I began attending this church. The pastor encouraged everyone in the audience. He said, what's the most important thing in your life? Is it you or is it God? And I recommitted my life to Christ at that moment and then went into ministry. And when I started doing ministry, I had this idea that I was going to do all these great things for God. I became a youth pastor and I started this little youth group with about 12 kids in a tiny little town in Iowa. And before we knew it, we had hundreds of kids coming to this youth group every week. And I thought that God was really pleased with me because I was doing all these great things for God. But as I was growing my youth ministry, I thought I knew everything there was to know about God and about church and about Jesus and about the Bible, especially about Catholicism. The truth is, I really didn't know anything about Catholicism. I grew up not knowing much about it. The only thing I knew about the Catholic Church was what I saw from people who hated it and what I listened to them telling me about it. And the Catholics I knew didn't really practice their faith at all. In fact, the most important person in my life at the time was someone who didn't practice her faith in Catholicism at all, but grew up that way. That was my wife. When I first met her, I said to her, hey, are you a Christian? She said, well, I'm Catholic. Does that count? I said, nope, not at all. Come to church with me. So she did, and we left her Catholicism behind. We got married and started a family, and we were functioning as this pastor's family in this church, growing this little youth group, and it was amazing. Well, one day I realized I needed to have a logo for my youth group because I couldn't just call it youth group, right? It had to be something cool so we could make stickers and t-shirts. It was going to be awesome. So I called up this guy in the yellow pages and he was a graphic designer. And I said, hey, I'd like to talk to you about my youth ministry and designing a logo. And he said, sure, I'd love to talk to you about that. And as we began to talk, I, I, I could sense that this guy had an excitement in his voice about the faith. And he invited me over to his house one night to look at some of his ideas for his youth group. And I thought, sure, I'll go over there and who knows, maybe I'll get this guy to become part of my youth ministry. He'll be one of my volunteers. It was my anniversary that night. And I told my wife, I'll be back in about 20 minutes. Well, when I got out of the car and walked up to his house, I noticed that he had these statues on the front steps of his house. There was a Virgin Mary, I recognize that one. There was uh, St. Joseph, I recognized that one. And then there was this other guy with a parrot on his shoulder. I figured, okay, that must be St. Francis or something. I wasn't sure exactly. But when the guy answered the door, he welcomed me into his house. And this house looked like something I'd seen out of like a movie. It's slightly less Catholic looking than like the Sistine Chapel. That's how I describe it to people today. There were no televisions in the house. There were only icons and statues and pictures of all these Catholic looking people. And when I sat down at his dining room table and to look at the ideas that he had for my youth ministry, that I was blown away. This guy was amazingly talented. And as we began to talk, he asked me questions about my church. And then I started asking him questions about his church. And he was telling me all about his faith in Christ. And I said, wait a second, I just have one question for you. You say you love Jesus, but what's with all this Catholic stuff? And he just laughed and he said, yeah, I'm Catholic because I love Jesus. And I had two thoughts that went through my mind at that moment. The first one was this. If this guy is truly on fire for Jesus, 
I can convince him to be part of my church and leave his Catholicism behind in about five minutes by showing him just some very simple Bible verses because that's what I'd done for so long. The second thought was this, I better not offend him though because he's an awesome designer and I want him to design this logo for my youth ministry. So we began to have this conversation. And as I began to share my faith, he began to share his and I realized quickly I didn't know what I was in for. He started asking me questions and asking me about the Bible and about the church fathers and about how I knew what Christianity even was. And after two hours had gone by, his wife said from the upstairs, hey, didn't Keith say it was his anniversary? He better get going. And I remembered I was supposed to be home hours ago. Well, as I got ready to leave, he handed me a VHS tape with a guy shaking hands with the Pope who looked like my dad. And he said, this guy was like you only worse and he became Catholic and he handed me this tape. It was the Scott Hahn conversion story. So I drove home that night and I was determined to watch this video the next day, still thinking in my mind I was gonna convince this guy to become Protestant. Well, I was blown away when I watched that talk and that conversation led to many other conversations. And what I realized was that I was in over my head. Everything I thought that I knew about the Catholic Church was mostly based on misconceptions. The the people that I had looked to as my examples for Catholics were, were people who didn't really practice their faith. And I had learned that there was a lot more than meets the eye. This friendship that I had with this man was was very important in my life. I was convinced that I could make him Protestant and he was convinced that he could make me Catholic. So we began this dialogue that lasted for years and it was amazing. And the truth is, there were things in my my reflections on Catholicism, my objections that I had to it. I didn't want to admit it to him, but they were being knocked down one by one. And at at the time I was going to seminary to to learn more about the Protestant faith and and go deeper in that. So I would take the things that I was learning from my friend about the Catholic Church and I would go quiz my church history professors, my theology teachers. And you know what, here's the thing, they didn't have answers. And slowly but surely, God was knocking down all of these barriers in my heart. I had an experience one night when we were at our church camp with all of our kids everywhere and we were worshiping God together And we were in this room and my friend who was a Protestant pastor was leading our camp group in the Eucharistic liturgy or whatever. And he took bread and he said, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this represents my body broken for you. And a lightning bolt hit me right in the chest. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Keith, you know, that's not what I said. Jesus never said this represents anything. He said, this is my body. I walked out out of that chapel went down front of the parking lot and I just began to be broken before God. And I picked up my phone and I called my friend and I said, I think God's calling me to become Catholic. And he said to me, Keith, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And I was convinced that my life was about to change. Now you gotta remember something. This was my job. This was my career. This was the only thing I'd ever known how to do. This was all I cared about. And and in about the 50 feet from the parking lot where I had that phone conversation to walking into that room, something changed within me. I walked in and I looked around and I saw my wife with our three little kids and our youngest in a stroller and she was wheeling them around. And I saw these 150 teenagers in there worshiping Jesus and this little voice inside my head said, Keith, are you really going to blow all this up to become Catholic? Are you really going to mess up your entire family and leave all these kids behind who are looking to you? Are you really going to do that? Come on, Keith. You don't really want to do that. And you know what? I'm, I'm sad to say <clears throat> that's the voice I listened to. See, I wasn't willing to sell what I had to get that treasure in that field in that moment. I was looking at what I had and I was looking at what God wanted me to do. And I was saying, you know, I'm pretty afraid of being obedient to God. See, there's a moment in your life, my friends, when you have to ask yourself, how much is obedience gonna cost me and am I willing to do it? And at that moment in my life, I wasn't. So I turned my back on my friendship with this guy. I didn't like break up with him officially as friends, but I just quit talking to him. I stopped reading the church fathers. I stopped thinking about the Catholic faith and I ran the other way as far as I could. And really what I ran into was a very deep, dark, depressing time of my life See, I believed that my life had meaning because my youth ministry was so awesome and I could do all these great things for God. But when things started to tank, I started to tank. And I wound up turning far away from God. I never lost my faith, but I lost my ministry. Because I came into this place where I realized that 
I had become more about me than I was about God and I needed to get right. So I took a couple years off from ministry and just began to focus on my faith. And what I learned in that time was that God's never looking for people to do things for Him. What God is looking for are people that He can do things through. So after a couple of years went by, I re-engaged in ministry and I started doing things with a different spirit, with a different heart, not trying to do something great for God, but just trying to fall in love with Jesus in a more deep, in a more deep way. And I wound up back in this big church doing ministry, but my heart was different. And, and I, had, I had all of this engagement with Catholicism in my past, but it started to kind of rear its head back in my life years later. The denomination that I served was going through a lot of turmoil and, and, and it was beginning to split apart because people didn't understand the authority of the church. And, and people were starting to veer away from what I viewed as biblical, historical Christianity. But when I would try to argue with people and say, look, we need to stick with what the Bible says, they would say things to me like, well, Keith, that's just your interpretation of the Bible. What makes you so right? So then I would say things like, well, wait a minute. It's not just my interpretation of the Bible. This is what the church has taught for 2,000 years. And they would say things to me like, well, which church? And I would say things like, well, Jesus Church. And what I realized that I was doing was I was making these old, tired arguments toward Catholicism that I had left behind years ago. They had found their way into the forefront of my heart. And I'm beginning to have all of these conversations about church authority. And I had a friend of mine who was a pastor, and she said to me at one point in time, Keith, if you believe all this church authority stuff, then why aren't you Catholic? And I was like, wow, that hit me like a ton of bricks. So I started to re-explore some of these things. I began to talk with my Catholic friends, including my friend I was telling you about earlier. And one of my Catholic friends said to me, Keith, maybe you ought to meet with a priest and begin to talk about this. I called up this local priest in my town and I arranged to meet with him. He said, come to the 1205 Mass on Tuesday afternoon and we'll go to lunch afterwards and talk. So I went down to this 1205 Mass on a Tuesday afternoon and I was blown away initially because I'm like, what are all these people doing here in the middle of the afternoon on a weekday to go to church? See, we didn't have anything like that at the church I came from. We couldn't get people together unless there was a musical thing, a sermon, some big event. And yet here were all these people coming into the church to worship God in the middle of the day on a Tuesday afternoon. Now lots of people have these big aha moments at Mass usually when the consecration happens or something, but I had a different aha moment at Mass that day, and it was during the processional. See, as I'm standing there feeling a little bit awkward, not really knowing what's going on, the processional begins and the deacon walks in, and the deacon's holding up that, that red gospel book. And as he's walking forward, he's showing us this book, and it's as if he's saying, this matters to us. This is our foundation. This is important here. And as a guy who was struggling with feeling like my church was veering away from what the Bible says, to see a church hold that up so prominently, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. After Mass, I went out to lunch with that priest and I began to share with him where I was in my journey, how I was feeling drawn towards Catholicism, but not really sure if I could really go through with it because of what it would mean for my life practically. And I told him, I said, well, here's the deal. I think I just need more time to pray. I just need to think about it more. And he said, no, you don't. You need to make a decision. Are you willing to sell out for Jesus? Are you willing to follow God into obedience no matter what it costs you? He just called me out. And I wasn't ready to answer that question. So I began though to really dig in even more and more. As I began my journey towards Catholicism even more, I still had to do all the things I was doing as a pastor. And Advent was coming up that year. And it was my job to preach the first two weeks of our Advent sermon series. And we entitled our sermon series, Who Gets the News? And we were gonna talk about when different people found out that Jesus was coming. And I was in charge of the first two weeks. And the first week was when the priest Zechariah got the news. And we talked about how he got the news that John the Baptist was coming. And if you recall, the angel Gabriel visits him and shares with him that his wife Elizabeth is gonna be pregnant with a son. And Zechariah doesn't believe him. And the angel Gabriel says to Zechariah, I am the angel Gabriel. I stand at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And because you haven't believed me, I will render you unable to speak. That was week one. And I was, as week two approached, I was getting ready to preach a sermon on the Annunciation when the Blessed Mother receives the news from the angel Gabriel. Back in the Protestant world, we just called that Luke chapter one. And I'm in my office preparing this message. 
And as I'm reading this text, which I would read tons of times before, which I would preached through dozens of times before, something happened. And as I read the text, whenever I would read about the Virgin Mary, I just began to weep. And I felt this presence like I could never explain right there with me in my office. And I didn't understand what was happening to me. I, I was so moved and I didn't get it, but I knew that I had to just follow this. So I wrote this incredible sermon about the Blessed Virgin Mary receiving the news from the angel Gabriel. And when it came time for me to preach this sermon to my Protestant congregation, the sermon was all about how the Blessed Virgin Mary was the new Eve, the new Ark of the Covenant, the woman of Revelation 12. I talked all about how she was full of grace. And I talked about how the angel Gabriel humbles himself before her. The week before, he didn't humble himself before Zechariah, who was this priest. But when he comes and meets this, this precious, young, humble virgin, he humbles himself. I never had felt the Holy Spirit on me in preaching a sermon like I had that day. And you might think people would be like, oh, what is Keith doing? He's preaching all this Catholic stuff. They didn't think that at all. They were weeping too. As I looked out into the audience that day in the congregation, people had tears streaming down their faces. One man even came up to the front after the end, fell to his knees and began to pray. And I was like, there is something powerful here. And I didn't understand what it was. Friends, it was incredible. That week I met with one of my Catholic friends and I told him what had happened, how I think I'm falling in love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's something happening here. And I preached this sermon, the Holy Spirit's power came upon me and he just lost it too. He said, Keith, you need to follow this. You need to follow this. So that's what I did. I was still afraid. I still didn't know where God was leading me. I still didn't want to sell everything. I wanted to try to find a way to, to, to have all of this new stuff I was learning about Catholicism, but not have to blow my whole life up and lose everything. But that's not the way it works with Jesus. See, when you're called to follow Jesus, that's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to blow your life up. He wants to, to strip you down to everything so that he can rebuild you up into what he wants you to be, into who he wants you to be. And if you allow the Blessed Virgin Mary to be a part of that, she's going to take you by the hand and walk you into it. And I was walking into it step by step, still fearful, but excited. One morning I woke up and I, in my prayer time, I felt the Lord say to me, Keith, you need to get a hold of a man named Steve Ray. Now, Steve Ray, I was like, I think I know who that is. He's a guy that has converted to Catholicism. He's a Baptist guy, became a Catholic, and now he gives talks about the church. I had seen one of his videos on YouTube but I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about him, but I just felt the Lord saying, you need to get a hold of Steve Ray. Well, I thought about that the rest of the day, but I wasn't really sure what to do. And I had a dinner schedule with one of my Catholic friends that evening. And when I met him at the restaurant, he walked in and before he even sat down, he opened up his phone and he said, huh, my wife just texted me and said this, tell Keith, Steve Ray is going to be in town and you guys need to go hear this talk. Now, when she says in town, this is about an hour away because we didn't live in the same town. I flipped out. I said, we have to go. I called my wife. I said, look, I got to go. I'll be back late tonight, but there's this talk. I got to go here. And she was like, okay, go. So we drove and the entire way I'm thinking, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? We go to this parish where Steve's getting ready to give this talk. Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. And they're about to have mass. And I'm just, I'm just like a wreck. God, what's going on? I go up front to receive my blessing, because remember, I'm not Catholic, but I went up to receive my blessing, and I stepped off to the side, I hit my knees, and I looked up at the crucifix, and while people are receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, I prayed this prayer. I said, Jesus, this is it. If you want me to become Catholic, I will do it, but you've got to make a way. You've got to make a way. I, I don't know what to do. I don't understand what this looks like. I don't understand how this all could, could come together. I'm in charge of my family. I've got all this stuff. It's like, like, Lord, you've got to figure this out. You've got to tell me what it is. I need to know the way. But if you'll do that, then I will follow you. And, and as clear as I've ever heard anything in my life, in my heart, the Lord from the crucifix spoke to me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't need me to make a way, you just need me. And that hit me with everything. And I got up, tears streaming down my face. And I went back to my seat and I said, this is it, man. Steve got up and gave this amazing talk about how the early Christians were willing to sell everything in terms of everything, not just their stuff that I was worried about, 
but their very lives, that they were willing to die for the faith rather than pinch incense to idols. And here I was worried about what I was gonna do to earn money in my life and what I would have to sacrifice. That night on the way home, I told my friend, I said, that's it, I'm becoming Catholic. When I walked in the house, Zell said, how'd it go? And I told her, I said, honey, I've gotta tell you something. I need to quit my job because I need to become Catholic. Now I was terrified what this was gonna mean. Because remember, she was raised Catholic, but her faith didn't mean anything to her. But I took her away from that and that cost her a lot. She was, she was uh, put out of her family for a while in terms of, of her, the approval of her family because of this. And now here I was 20 some years later telling her I need to become Catholic. And I was, I was kind of afraid of like, what's she gonna think? What's she gonna say? Is she gonna freak out? And she just said, Keith, I'm so proud of you because I know that you're seeking God's will and whatever God wants for you, I'm with you and we'll get through it. I'm very blessed, you guys. So the next day I went into my senior pastor's office at the church and I told him, I said, look, that's it. I gotta become Catholic. Of course, he was blown away. What are you talking about? So I resigned my position in my church that I loved. I, I said goodbye to all these people that I cared about. Our church was getting ready to build a $10 million new megaplex on the edge of town. We'd worked so hard, but I was on a different journey. And I knew that I had to give all that up to follow Jesus into his church. My last Sunday there was the day that we put shovels in the ground to break ground. The following Sunday, I had gone from the newest church in town to the oldest church in town. And as I was meeting with my priest weekly on this process to become Catholic, I remember we had been meeting for a few months and God was showing me some amazing things. And I'd gotten to this point where, where it didn't matter to me what I was gonna be giving up because I was so excited about what I was gonna be receiving. And he said to me, Keith, I think you're ready. When do you wanna do this? And we picked the day, this random day on the calendar of October 8th, 2017. There was no rhyme or reason behind that day. It's just the day that we picked. So as that day approached, I was so excited about coming into the church, but I had, still had no answers for what I was gonna ultimately do with my life. But when I got up to receive my sacraments for the first time, I knew that God's plan was more than I could ever imagine. And, and when I received Jesus for the first time, it was so incredible. I went back to my, my seat and it came time to pass the peace. And when the priest said, let us offer each other the sign of peace, I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I turn around and guess who's standing there? Steve Ray. Now he lives nine and a half hours away from where I live, but he just happened to be at that parish, at that mass, in town, giving a talk that day. I couldn't believe it, I was blown away. He said, Keith, welcome home, brother. You'll never look back. Now I'll tell you guys something. When Jesus talks about that treasure hidden in a field, what he says blew me away. Because he says that in his joy, the man sold all he had. Now, how can you have joy while at the same time selling all you have? Can you imagine selling all you have for that one thing? But here's the thing, we are not called to be, to be grouchy about it. We are not called to have regret. We are not called to, to feel sorry for ourselves because what God is calling us into is gonna require sacrifice, but it's gonna be for your joy. But notice this, to get to that treasure, you've gotta dig. And in your joy, you leave everything behind. People ask me all the time, they say, Keith, did, did you have, did you lose friends? Did you lose this? Did you lose, what, like, what did it cost you to become Catholic? And my answer is this, it cost me everything. Everything I was afraid of losing, it all came true. I lost my job, I lost my retirement, I lost friends, I lost my men, all of those things. But I can honestly tell you this, following Jesus into his church has given me so much treasure, a treasure beyond anything that I could ever possibly imagine. Because here's the thing, Earlier in my life, I was more afraid of what obedience was gonna cost me. But when you recognize the treasure that is waiting for you, you're gonna become more afraid of what disobedience will cost you. So I want you to really think about that. Are you afraid of being obedient or are you afraid of being disobedient? Because coming into the church for me wasn't this thing, Keith, you better do this or else. It was, Keith, let me invite you into the most amazing adventure that you could ever have in your entire life. And for me, that's what Catholicism is. It's the greatest adventure. It's the greatest source of joy in my life. It's the most amazing thing that I get to experience being a part of Jesus' church. And everything that it cost me, 
is nothing. St. Paul says that I count it all loss. He gave up everything he had in his, in his Jewish ministry to follow Jesus. And he says, I count it all as lost for what I have gained. Friends, I've gained so much. I've gained so much. And it doesn't matter how much money I, I make or don't make. It doesn't matter whether I have some big fancy ministry or don't. None of that matters. What matters is that I'm exactly where the Lord wants me to be. And that's been the most incredible experience of my life. About a year after I became Catholic, at my wife's and my priest's uh, encouragement, I decided to start engaging in ministry again, not as a job, not to try to do something crazy, but just to answer the question that people would always ask me, Keith, what did you do? What happened to you? So I began to share my story publicly and, and, and I began to talk in churches and, and post things on YouTube and quickly things began to open up to me. I wrote a book called The Convert's Guide to Roman Catholicism, your first year in the church about my own experience as a brand new Catholic, what that was gonna be like. And it was almost like Our Lady and Our Lord had said to me, Keith, now I'm gonna show you what it's like to let God do things through you rather than you do things for God. And as that began to happen, friends, my life has changed so much. These days I get to travel around and and give talks in churches and meet with people and help bring people into the church. I get to to make videos about it on YouTube. I get to to lead people in all kinds of of incredible experiences, especially praying the rosary. My wife and I sold a business that we had and we bought an RV and now we travel around the country and we go from place to place praying the rosary. We have an online rosary ministry that reaches out all around the world, over 80 countries and thousands of people every day. I have a greater joy in my life, in my faith, than I've ever possibly experienced, my friends. And it just keeps getting better and better. The treasure that you find in your faith, you've got to dig for it. And when you open that box, There's so much inside. So I want to encourage you. What are you converting from? Maybe you've been a Catholic your whole life, but you don't really follow the faith very strongly. You just go through the motions. I want to invite you into a conversion. I want to invite you into obedience. I want to invite you to sell all you have and pick up that treasure. Maybe you've been an atheist. You don't even believe in God. And somehow you stumbled upon this channel and these videos. Friend, I want to encourage you. Dig in. See what God would speak to you. Don't be afraid. Because what God wants to do in your life will blow your mind. Or maybe you're a Protestant, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are, we're all called to convert to something or from somewhere. So follow Jesus, sell out to Him. Let the Blessed Mother lead you into that field and dig deep and you'll be so blessed. And I guarantee you, the same has been true for me. You will never look back. You will never regret it. You will never be sorry for what you've done. Friends, thanks so much for watching this video. Let's conclude with a Hail Mary in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. That was awesome. Thank Thank you you so much.